this morning, it's the very exciting theme of metatranscriptomics. Uh, and again, hands up for those of you who are interested in doing some metatranscriptomics. Those of you who have zero interest in metatranscriptomics. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, you should all be interested. And hopefully part of my goal is to convince you why is that popped up? Is to convince you that um, we should be thinking about doing metatranscriptomics in our data sets. And Ryan, who's just walking in there, Ryan will be taking you through the tutorial um, at the end of this talk. All right. So module six, metatranscriptomics, created commons, open source, free to share, use, however you want to see fit these materials. Okay, so what are we hoping to learn today? So I'm not wearing the mic, so I'm going to raise my voice then. Uh, I'm, I'm fine without the mic. Um, so, so at the end of this module, um, as I say, one of the main things I want to get across is maybe a little bit more of appreciation for metatranscriptomics. Uh, understand its capabilities, what it can do that, say, 16S and metagenomics can't do. Um, I want to go over some um, ideas behind sample collection, experiment design, and so forth. And then hopefully picking up, uh, we're going to go through our pipeline, which is called Metapro. Uh, it finally got published last month. Hooray for us. Um, Obviously, we promote our pipeline, but um, you should also feel free to think about creating your own pipelines as well, because each of us may have slightly different needs. Um, and then the tutorial itself will take you through processing a simple metatranscriptomic data set. Uh, and then at the end, we have this kind of visualization kind of tutorial, which is based on Cytoscape. Who's used Cytoscape before? Okay, well, that's great that there's only three of you. So Cytoscape should be new to everybody. We just find it a, a generally really useful tool for just doing visualizations of all sorts of different data sets. And so if you can think about a heat map, rather than presenting a heat map for your data, you can actually present it as a network. And so it gives you an alternative way of kind of presenting your data helps you maybe interpret your data a little differently as well. So um, beyond just this metatranscriptomics, we think putting you through this kind of exercise working with Cytoscape, you might, again, just find generally useful in your own research if you're applying it in other contexts. So it's a tool that's being developed by a colleague at U of T, um, as well as a, um, somebody, I think he's at UCSD, Trey Idecker. Gary Bader is our colleague at U of T. So he's been working on Cytoscape since about 2003, 2004. Very well supported, lots of plugins and different stuff that you can do with that. But uh, we'll go through that in the tutorial. Okay. Metatranscriptomics, why metatranscriptomics? So 16S, we know it's good for telling us who's there but it only gives us relatively limited mechanistic insights. So then metagenomics, which was all day yesterday, we're all very excited about metagenomics. Costs of it are starting to come down a little bit. The ways that we're using metagenomics data is starting to become a little bit more standardized as well. And it's really good at identifying function and determining differences in functions across samples. But as I say, what I want to try and get across today is metatranscriptomics, where it's not just what functions are present in a sample, it's which ones are actually active. So it's telling you something about what is the active function of a microbiome, or rather who is doing what. Um, so the idea behind metatranscriptomics, so similar to metagenomics, where you're just doing whole shotgun DNA, here we're doing whole shotgun RNA. And so this can tell us which genes, which pathways are actually being actively expressed within the community. So here is a, this is a, again, a cytoscape visualization. These are genes that are all involved in cell wall biogenesis. And then these pie charts, the size of the pie charts are representing the uh, relative expression of each of these genes in cell wall biogenesis. 
And then the breakdown are showing the taxa that are contributing to those functions. So these kind of visualizations really give you an idea of who is actually doing what within your community. And then because you're looking at relative expression, you can look at changes in relative expression uh, across different data sets. And so these red arrows here indicate those genes that have been upregulated. In this case, this is a sequel sample from a chicken. And uh, this is the difference between chicken, which has been given uh, antibiotic growth motants. So these are these antibiotics that you put in livestock feed. And when you give the chickens these antibiotics in their feed, then lo and behold, a lot of these cell wall biogenesis genes expressed in the microbiome are actually going up, which is potentially not that surprising, but it's nice to see this kind of demonstration that you can see how a microbiome is responding, not necessarily in composition, but in terms of its activity to some kind of external perturbation. Okay, so to give you an idea of the sort of things we can do with metatrans metatranscriptomics, what we can learn using these kind of data sets. This is a study that we published back in 2017. It's looking at this perilipin-2 gene. So perilipin-2, it's a gene that's involved in lipid uptake in the gut. Uh, and this is with colleagues, um, uh, Dan Frank uh, at the University of Colorado. And they have this mouse model, and they find that in this mouse model, deletion of this PLIN2 mice largely abrogates the negative consequences of a high fat diet. And so we were kind of interested in understanding, well, what impact does this PLIN2 knockout have on the microbiome? So we did this relatively simple experiment. We had four sets of mice. Uh, we had two diets, high fat diet, low fat diet. And then we have two genotypes, the wild type mice and then the PIN2 knockout mice. And then we applied this whole microbiome RNA seq, this metatranscriptomics, and we generated 20 to 30 million reads per mouse. And what we found when we looked at the composition, so PIN2 high fat diet, wild type high fat diet, we saw that there is no difference in community composition. So they effectively had under a high fat diet, both these types of mice seem to have similar community composition. However, when we looked at the gene expression, we found that despite having these almost identical uh, communities, uh, they did have a significant difference in terms of the genes that they're expressing. So we identified about a thousand highly expressed microbial genes that were differentially expressed between these two genotypes, okay? So these genotype, this genotype is having a difference. It's altering the function of the microbiome. So the microbiome is the same, but the functions, what's the pathways that have been expressed are actually changing. Many of these uh, differentially expressed genes were associated with amino acid metabolism, energy metabolism. And we were particularly interested in this particular pathway. So this is glycolysis. And what these kind of dots represent here, these are enzymes. And the size of the enzymes represents the average expression. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm not allowed to move. I see. Okay. Um, so when we when we uh, map these kind of gene expression differences in the context of this glycolysis pathway, what we see is this large tract going from uh, what is it? One um, uh, fructose six phosphate. All the, day, all the way down to pyruvate, this is where a lot of ATP is being produced in this particular pathway. So the PLIN2 knockout mice are actually down-regulating this part of the pathway. They don't seem to need as much ATP production. And so this helps us kind of think about building some kind of model where in a wild-type mice, you have um, these fats in the diet, these fats are being absorbed uh, by the intestinal cells, that you have this PLIN2, this wild type PLIN2, you have this regular functional PLIN2, these lipids are getting absorbed. So not much is necessarily left over for the rest of the microbiome and the lumen of the gut. However, in the PLIN2 knockout mice, what's happening is that you're not getting the same uptake of fats. As a consequence, you have more of these triglycerides in the lumen of the gut. And because you have this extra availability of these triglycerides, there's more than sufficient energy for the, micro, uh, for the microbiota. And as a consequence, they can dial back their energy metabolism because they're already producing a lot of energy and they can switch, um, they can switch their expression into other types of pathways. So this is an example, I think, and hopefully a convincing example 
where we use metatranscriptomics to actually understand and starting to get at some mechanism um, of why changes in, in this case, it was a, um, a gene, different genotype in a mouse, a, a knockout of a mouse, how that actually results in changes in the expression of certain pathway functions. Okay, so hopefully that's a little bit convincing for you. Um, when we look at the uptake of metatranscriptomics, so on the left here, we have um, publications with the word microbiome, on the right, publications with the word metatranscriptome, metatranscriptomics or metatranscriptome. And if you look at the y-axis, we can see it's still a very slow uptake, okay, in terms of how many publications, how many people are actually using metatranscriptomics in their data sets. Um, but maybe it's starting to catch on. And I think maybe one of the biggest drawbacks of metatranscriptomics is, one, it can be a little bit challenging because you're dealing with RNA and not DNA. And secondly, it is more expensive. So library preparation costs are probably the main expense, and it's about $250 per sample at the moment. Now, we're hoping that these costs can come down. There are colleagues at the Sanger Center who are doing very high throughput, um, tens of thousands of samples for metatranscriptomes. And so they're really motivated to try and bring these costs down. And hopefully, if they can, they could come up with uh, new ways of doing these live preparations that will bring the cost down for everyone else. So I guess we're at a stage now where it's a balance between, well, how much do we want to spend? How much can we learn uh, versus the actual cost of these kinds of experiments? OK, so other examples of uh, metatranscriptomics on the left. This was a paper that was published last year in ISMI journal. Uh, here they were interested in looking at soil microbiomes to isolate genes that would be useful for the processing of arsenic. And rather than relying on metagenomics, they actually didn't care if an arsenic gene was actually present or not. They wanted it to be actively expressed. And they used that as a criteria for saying this is the kind of gene that we want to focus on because it seems to be expressed, it seems to be used within the context of this microbiome. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is from Curtis Huttenauer's group. This was from 2018. Here they applied metatranscriptomics to IBD samples. They found uh, that specific taxa contributed unique pathway expressions. So they're starting to really to dissect the individual contributions of different taxa. Um, those have found that there are taxa that are very abundant from the metagenomics uh, point of view, but are actually quite um, quiet. They don't seem to be very active. And so there's this concept with metagenomics that we may be able to sample all the DNA in the sample, but is that really reflective of the activity? Is this DNA that's just been shared? How reflective is um, metagenomic analysis, metagenomic um, kind of data? telling us in terms of what is functionally happening in, in that particular data set. Uh, the other thing that metatranscriptomics enables us to access that metagenomics doesn't are RNA viruses. So um, this, is a, this is a study that we did recently on mice and we recovered these, uh, what are they, astroviruses. And it turns out that our pipeline does a really good job of out of these um, hundreds of millions of sequence reads, actually reassembling entire viral genomes. So it seems to be a really good way of being able to identify novel RNA viruses. And a colleague from U of T, Artem uh, Babayan, he's just a um, new faculty member, he published this paper just last month where he used all these metatranscriptomic data sets uh, to expand this universe of RNA viruses. And obviously there's big implications for future pandemics and so forth. So again, it's, a, it's kind of a, a novel aspect of metatranscriptomics given as access to information that metagenomics just isn't able to uh, provide us with. Okay, so how does this work? Well, it's pretty much the same as an, as an RNA-seq experiment. You extract the RNA, you fragment, you sequence, uh, you align to known transcripts and you end up with this digital readout of gene expression. So it's very similar to single organism RNA-seq, but it does have its own challenges. So in a typical kind of RNA-seq experiment, you apply RNA-seq to maybe a single eukaryotic organism. Um, and 
if you're dealing with eukaryotes, you're able to isolate the RNA through the poly A tail. Now, unfortunately, bacteria don't have poly A tails. Um, so this means that you have to sequence all of the RNA and all of the RNA includes ribosomal RNA, which makes up about 95% or so of the RNA in a typical bacterial cell. So somehow you've got to um, get over the fact that how do you enrich for this messenger RNA? Um, another um, factor in RNA-seq is you generally have a reference genome, and so you're able to map your sequence reads that reference genome. When we're applying metatranscriptomics, we generally don't have that reference genome, and so doing this mapping, identifying what the source of these transcripts from can be quite challenging. So the kind of challenges that we're facing is, first of all, compared to metagenomics, DNA is relatively stable, RNA not very stable. So you have to be, when you're doing the isolation of the RNA, you have to be working in very, very clean conditions, making sure um, all of your um, all of your surfaces are wiped down with agents that are going to counteract uh, RNAs. Uh, we also have this lack of poly A tails. There's also host contamination, which uh, was briefly touched on yesterday. So the host is going to have um, a lot of RNA as well. And depending on the sample that you are uh, sampling from, you can get a lot of host contamination. In humans, um, that could be problematic from an REB perspective in terms of screening out those kind of human reads before you're stopping to get. Um, but at the same time, there's a possibility of using the host RNA signal to get an idea of what is the host actually doing? How is that responding to uh, the microbiome as well? So it's kind of a, um, it, it can provide some, com um, some, some benefits as well. These are also very, very complex data sets featuring hundreds or thousands of different taxa. And so there's this question of what is the depth of sequencing that we need to do in order to best sample from all the different taxa that are within our, within our particular sample. And also, as I mentioned, we have this lack of reference sequences. We're, we're generating sequence from strains that we've never encountered before. And so how problematic is that when we're doing our mapping of these reads back to their original transcripts. Okay, so the first challenge that we face is the kind of instability of RNA. So RNA quality can deteriorate very rapidly. Um, and so the ideal is to try and get your sample to minus 80 as quickly as possible. So a study that we're involved in in Pakistan with, through the Aga Khan University, they're working with these field sites and they are able to get a stool sample to um, minus 80 within um, about two and a half hours of collection, okay? So they have a really phenomenal way of being able to manage the collection and maintaining the integrity of the samples. In Toronto, unfortunately, we don't have that same level of um, capability. And so we're working with newcomer communities. A lot of these newcomers, um, and, and this is these are young women that are pregnant. A lot of these newcomers are living in shared housing. They don't have access to a fridge. And so we had to identify a solution where the RNA could actually be preserved at room temperature so that they could send it through the mail to us. And there's a number of kits that have been developed. So Zama Research has this DNA RNA shield. Norgen has a kit. The one we've selected is this Omnigene gut kit, which was just released last year, uh, which is supposed to be very good at maintaining the integrity of RNA in samples, I think up to about a month or so. And by that stage, you hopefully have them put on minus 80. One thing people have been trying to suggest is RNA later. Um, we find that RNA later seems to interfere with the library preparation kits, and so we don't advocate the use of RNA later in trying to store and maintain these samples. So how do each of these kits perform? So Zyma Research, uh, Norgen, this is interesting. The colored bars at the top are showing, for example, with the shield or with the kit, that the kind of the breakdown in terms of taxa that you recover is as good as the original sample. What they're actually showing though is DNA, they're not showing RNA. It's only the bottom kind of, um, um, and they call gels that are really showing how they're better able to preserve the RNA. 
It's only DNA Genotech on the right hand side, which is showing the RNA breakdown in terms of taxonomic composition, showing that this uh, DNA Genotech kind of kit seems to do a pretty reasonable job of maintaining the quality. Uh, and one thing you might notice from this uh, Zymo research, so this RNA later here, this thing here, no recovery of any RNA. So it seems to do a really poor job, at least under the conditions that they were doing their trials. So we think that this DNA Genotech kit seems to be pretty reasonable, and that's the one that we're currently using for our studies. Um, so I mentioned that one of the reasons I think maybe metatranscriptomics isn't adopted or isn't as widespread as you think it might be is that it is expensive. It's largely because of this library preparation. So Illumina has this joint kit, which, um, um, which um, does this kind of library preparation for you, and it's about $250 a sample. And then on top of the sequencing cost, it works out to about $300, $400 a sample. But the main cost, again, is really the generation of the libraries. And if we can come up with some kind of homebrew solutions or better solutions that don't rely on these expensive kits, then that could really drop the price down. The other thing that um, can potentially cause uh, a lot of issues in terms of costs is how many replicates do we need? And again, this is a pretty nascent field. Um, and so it's very hand wavy. Uh, we, we are going to have, I think, a little bit of a discussion about power calculations this afternoon with Anita. Um, but these are um, kind of very challenging analyses to do because we just don't have the data. There aren't the number of studies out there that are able to give us the statistics that we need to come up with more compelling kind of power calculations. So in terms of mice, we're suggesting at least four, it's probably six is probably a good idea in terms of replicates. But that's given these mice are under similar conditions and their microbiome isn't changing. If you're looking at individuals where there's a lot of variation, then you're probably looking at a minimum of 40, um, 40 individuals in order to get at some kind of signal that you might be able to detect. This is very hand wavy numbers. And again, Anita, I think we'll be discussing this more this afternoon. Um, the next major challenge that we face with RNA um, data sets is this large amount of this ribosomal RNA. So as I mentioned, it can make up as much as 95% of all of the RNA within a bacterial cell. And so there have been kits that have been developed which decrease um, and filter out these highly abundant ribosomal RNA species. These kits do put in biases, so they seem to be better at some taxa than other taxa for removing the ribosomal RNA. Overall, uh, they do a fairly decent job. So the current kit that we use is this Ribo Zero kit. So this is part of this Illumina uh, library preparation. So it does the Ribo Zero depletion, and then it also does the library preparation at the same time. So it's all in one kit, $250. That's fantastic. We should all be buying shares in Illumina. Um, one thing we find with these kits, though, is, again, they're designed for bacteria. So on the right-hand side, uh, this is a study where we're infecting mice with a protist. And for the first eight lanes, uh, this is a naive mouse. It hasn't been infected with a protist. On the right-hand side, it has been infected with a protist. And that big kind of dark blue bar is ribosome and RNA associated with the protist. So when we're thinking about these kits that we're applying to deplete this RNA, they're gonna work for the certain taxa that they've been set up for, but they're not gonna work for other taxa. So if you're interested in certain types of organisms that may not be captured by these kits, then you are gonna run into these uh, problems where you are gonna have a lot of ribosome and RNA in uh, example. And then just to mention that we do get hosts, we do recover host messenger RNAs. Um, and while this can be challenging, it can be informative. So you don't necessarily have to throw out those reads. You could actually use them for an additional part of your analysis. Any questions on any of this so far? I'm not seeing any hands go. Oh, yes. Um, Are they 
it, it comes down to your budget. So, you know, I think most of our experiments, we run a max of about 32 mice, right? And so it's, okay, what are we going to gain most from these 32 mice? Because that's going to cost us about 18000 or $20,000, right? Um, I think the key is to think about this as hypothesis generation. The statistics aren't necessarily going to give you a definitive answer, but if it's starting to come up with the pathways, and I think this is more of the powerful approach is the individual genes could be very flaky. When you start putting them into the context of gene sets, and I'll mention this um, in a little bit as we get to the end of the talk, uh, I think that's where the power of these analyses come in, because you can see entire pathways or entire complexes or biological processes that are, again, upregulated or downregulated. You may not care about the individual specific genes, but you just see that entire wave of function going up. And that gives you confidence that what you're seeing really is real. And then you can design, for example, specific uh, DNA uh, primers, just to PCR up on some of the genes that you want to follow up on, maybe do a larger experiment, larger number of samples without paying the $18,000 for, for this. So you can think of this more as a discovery tool and then going back and reperforming an experiment with some more kind of focused but cheaper kind of experiments. Yeah. What's RNA kit? The RNA in your samples. So you're basically like sending them off to people and then they're putting it in the kit and then just mailing it. How long does it take for it to get like That's a really good question. Um, so in our Toronto cohort, yeah. due to COVID slowdown, uh, research coordinators um, leaving us for more, more kind of richer pastures with private uh, CROs, um, we have recruited a total of one individual. And so I think it took one week through the post for that sample to actually arrive and then we've stuck it at minus 80. Samples from Sonic, but we need them from the Ottawa. Okay. You can always use FedEx. I'm not sure that, you know, we have the added shipping. Yeah. So then again, it, start, it starts mounting yeah. up. Whereas in Pakistan, you've got actual people in the field right. that are able to collect the samples and then take them to um, stick them on minus 80 straight away. So, yeah, we are at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, the other thing I want to mention is this concept of absolute abundance and quantifying absolute abundance. So how many of you are aware of this issue of relative abundance versus absolute abundance? Yeah, so I think there's more and more appreciation that we need to consider this in our analyses, whether it's 16S, whether it's metagenomics, whether it's metatranscriptomics. More and more of these studies and, um, and reviewers are asking for, well, can you quantify what the actual level of material is uh, in, in, in your actual sample? And how does that go from sample to sample? Uh, so there's a number of ways that you can do this. Uh, there's flow cells, so you can actually count um, each of the individual bacteria as, it, as it's going through, and that can give you an idea of the abundance of bacteria within that sample. Uh, there's, CFA, there's CFU count, so you could just plate things out and look at one taxon that you know is going to grow under those plate conditions and see how that varies. Um, one that we have uh, used before is this Zymo uh, spiking kit, and we had pretty good success. This was a, a trial of chickens, and um, what this spike in, there's two taxa in there. And both of these taxa are supposed to be taxa that you would never find in a wild sample. So you can, you can easily identify them, distinguish them, and those are going to provide you with, as you're doing your um, uh, DNA extraction, you're adding this spike in right at the very beginning of the extraction step to your uh, stool sample, and then they're getting processed in exactly the same way at each step. Um, and then during the bioinformatics, you can actually identify which of your reads have come from those two taxa and use that to quantify, okay, given this level of reads that we spiked in, they're representing 10% of the sample or 50% of the sample, then that gives us a way of saying, well, how many other bacteria are in that sample? And it does a pretty good job. So this, as I mentioned, we did this in chickens. 
In the top, uh, the top row is a breakdown of taxa from a relative abundance point of view. Um, in the bottom set, uh, from an absolute abundance point of view. So it really is able to quantify differences. We find that, for example, the jejunum has roughly about 20% of the number of bacteria in terms of density relative to the cecum. Whereas before we know, you naively assume that they're kind of equivalent. So it's nice to see that you do get this kind of uh, lower level, uh, lower density of bacteria in the samples where you might expect to see that. And why do we think that this is important? So at the top, this is a readout based on relative abundance. Uh, that kind of dark red taxon at the top might suggest that at 24 days post hatch, um, those, those chickens have seen a decrease in bacteriolaceae, which is the, the dark red taxon. However, when you account for absolute abundance, there's actually no difference, okay? So unless you're accounting for this absolute abundance, you can get very misleading results and you can identify taxa that may appear to be up or down regulated, or in natural fact, when you account for this absolute abundance, then um, there's actually no difference, or they might be moving even in the opposite direction, yeah. Uh, possibly, I'm not sure I'd want to go that far just because of how things are collected at a later stage and batch effects and so forth. But Potentially, it might give you a little bit of an ability to do that, but I guess we need to start seeing meta-analyses uh, based on several different studies before we can start making those kind of claims. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is uh, <laughs> that we were discussing uh, a couple of weeks ago was, well, maybe it's not the density of bacteria. I mean, we talk about absolute abundance here, but we really don't know what the quantity of material is in the entire intestine and it's somehow, well, have you captured that? But that's a whole different question, right? So <laughs> I don't know if anyone's looking into the total quantification of stuff within somebody's gut, but I imagine that that is gonna be kind of interesting and probably gonna have some kind of functional ties associated with it. All right, uh, generating reads, how many reads are enough? Uh, this graph on the left-hand side, this was from a relatively early study where we compared uh, four different metatranscriptomes and we were looking at how many enzymes do you recover at increasing uh, sequencing depth? So it's kind of a rarefaction curve to show when you get saturation of, in this case, enzymes. And we find that Round about 90 to 95% of all of the enzymes as measured by these enzyme commission or these EC numbers um, can be recovered by about 5 million messenger RNA reads. And it, it's going to depend on the complexity of the sample, uh, but even a deep sea sample um, at about 5 million reads, we're seeing that we get around about 90, 95%. However, depending on the complexity of the sample, given that the cost of sequencing have come down, we generally do in the region about 40 to 80 million reads per sample. But again, depending on if you're after relatively low abundant taxa that you think might be contributing important functions, then obviously you have to sequence uh, much deeper. And so most of these experiments with RNA-seq, with, um, with this RNA-seq, with this metatranscriptomics, we really rely on um, not so much on PAC bio. We don't care if the read's long or not. I mean, these are transcripts. They kind of, you know, maximum of, maybe 2,000, maybe 5,000 base pairs. Um, we're really after the digital readout. What is the relative abundance? And so we just want these little tags, these short reads. And so we're really reliant on Illumina sequencing and particularly the NovaSeq uh, platform just because of the quantity of data it, it can produce. There's probably some um, application of PacBio and long reads if you really want to get a good um, I guess, idea of the diversity of the actual transcripts. Um, but most of what we've been doing are really relying on trying to come up with this counts or these kind of digital readouts of, of the relative expression of these genes. Okay, so we've gone through sample collection, storage, processing, sequencing. Now we have the data. This is where we're coming in. And 
We are generating data sets and um, Laura mentioned a, a publication yesterday with 300 billion reads. So certainly with better transcriptomics, we're generating billions of reads uh, per these experiments. And so we're really reliant on these kind of compute clusters. Um, so some of our data sets, uh, we run into problems, we run out of memory. Um, and this is, this is a bit of a challenge. Um, these are very complex data sets. We have to do comparisons against very large databases. The amount of memory we need per node is hundreds of, of uh, gigabytes. And so we really are reliant on getting access to these compute clusters and processing can be slow. I mean, we're talking maybe months for processing some of these data sets. So there's a lot of compute involved. So the data set that we're showing you today, again, as Laura mentioned, um, a lot of these steps we've actually pre-run for you, uh, just because it's just impossible to actually run these on our um, laptops and desktops. Uh, so I mentioned that we had a MetaPro pipeline just published recently. There's a couple of other pipelines that we compared against. So Human3 is one, and there's one called SAMHSA as well, which, is, which has been, and I'll, I'll mention some comparisons in the next couple of slides. Um, but the idea is very similar to um, processing metagenomics reads. You've got your, um, or your filtering of your low quality, of your adapters, but we also have an additional step where we need to filter out ribosomal RNAs because we know that even applying these RNA depletion kits, we're still going to get RNA creeping through. And so one of the tools that we use for this is one called Infernal. There's another one called Sort Me RNA. Sort Me RNA is great if you ask the quick, but quick could be writing a program saying move to the next step. And that would be quick, but it wouldn't be very effective. In the same way, sort me RNA only gets about 50% of the ribosomal RNA that Infernal does. And the problem with Infernal is that it is slow. So this is, again, one of these steps which slows down this kind of processing. And again, it's one of these steps that we will be skipping. It uses these hidden Markov models to actually identify, and it's a very sensitive way of identifying ribosomal RNAs in um, within your sample. But as I mentioned, other pipelines are using this sort me RNA, and I'm afraid it doesn't do that great a job. So we did compare our tool MetaPro with Human3 with SAMHSA2. Um, and basically all of these tools are kind of wrapper scripts that are using established kind of tools. So you could easily go ahead and build your own pipeline and maybe run it through step by step by step. We provide MetaPro, it's in this Docker container and this Docker container means that it should work in any architecture. So you just copy the, download the whole thing and it should just work. There's shouldn't be much in terms of getting installations, get it up and running. Um, on these compute clusters, there's a programming environment called Singularity. Who's heard of Singularity? Hooray. Uh, some of you have heard of Singularity. So Singularity enables you to use these Docker containers and have one of these Docker containers running on each node of your supercomputer. And so you can set up thousands of these jobs running at once. So um, we've really set this up to do this as, um, in, as much in parallel as possible to reduce processing times. Uh, in terms of comparisons with Human3, um, this was a kimchi data set that we looked at. So you can see the ribosomal RNA contributes a large, um, a large number of reads in these particular samples, and um, all three tools do a reasonable job. Actually, SAMHSA2 does a terrible job of doing ribosomal RNA, and I think that's because it is using sort me RNA. Yes. Right. So um, with the ribo zero depletion, um, I think we are able to get down to about 30% of the reads are ribosomal RNA. And so that means you've got 70% of your 
say you're doing 50 million reads, 70% would be 35 million reads are pretty good. So that's kind of pretty saturated. But again, it comes down to the kind of questions that you want to address. And I think because the cost of the sequencing is not the limiting step here, so much as the library preparation costs. So if you're already spending $250 on library preparation, then spending an additional 50 or $100 to get from say 20 million up to 60 million reads is probably worth the extra investment. No. I think you just go ahead and, and aim for about 50 to 80 million reads because that seems to be the bar at the moment for other studies. <laughs> not, very, not very useful, but you, you are starting to see stuff in those samples that you're not able to see when you're just doing 20 million reads. Sometimes you get a bad sample as well, so that even if you've generated, say, 50 million reads, you still only end up with 5 million just because of something that's happened within that particular sample, maybe the RNA depletion didn't work quite right. So just as a rule of thumb, we aim for, as I say, between about 40 and 60 or 40 and 80 million reads. And it, again, it just comes down to what you're happy with in terms of cost. Okay. Um, the other thing to note with our pipeline, so the things that are interesting are the things that we can annotate. These represent real bacterial genes and we can see that Metapro identifies and annotates stuff that the other two pipelines just says, oh, I don't know, it's something, but it's not a gene or anything. We, Metapro actually annotates 50% more in terms of the genes that it can identify. Uh, human 3, so I should mention that Human 3 is really built uh, as a metagenomics kind of pipeline. So I'm being a little bit unfair doing this comparison with Human 3. But they are supposed to do this kind of capability of doing metatranscriptomics analysis as well. One drawback I find with Human3 is that it's not terribly transparent in terms of getting intermediate data sets that you might want to get at in order to see. This enzyme here could be really interesting in terms of its expression. How many reads actually map to that particular enzyme? And getting that information out of the Human3 data is not that easy. I don't know if Morgan has any comments on human three? Okay. Um, so one important step that we find for metatranscriptomics is assembly. And we find that if we can assembly, this really improves annotation accuracy. So again, the whole point of metatranscriptomics, we want a digital readout of gene expression. We rely on these short reads. But because we have short reads, that limits our ability to annotate them because you've only got 150 base pairs to map to something else. And we find that you need to get in the region of about 200 or so base pairs really to have a good chance of matching something accurately um, to something in the database. So we use RNA, sp RNA spades to build these kind of transcripts, and then we use MetaGMark uh, to separate these into individual ORFs. Um, which can then be um, um, which can then be annotated. We have looked into chimeras. Uh, these can uh, occur because uh, you get orthologs from different species and they're kind of mixed together. Uh, however, we did an analysis of this number of years ago and we found that in these data sets, only about two to five percent of what we're assembling actually turns out to be chimeras. So it doesn't seem to be a problem that we're too worried about. Yes. Uh, so that depends on the complexity and depth of sequencing in your sample. Um, but for a chicken microbiome, for example, a chicken metatranscriptome, uh, assembled reads are in the region of about 10 to 20 percent and then unassembled reads are probably in the order of about 60 70 percent something like that so it is uh it is the case that we do have a lot of these kind of singletons that we just aren't able to assemble yes still try and annotate them absolutely yeah yeah I think the cost is too prohibitive when you, uh, I mean, what is the MySeq? My, one MySeq run can do what about 40 million reads of it? 
But NextSeq is quite expensive as well, isn't it? Relative to SonovaSeq. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've done the processing. We've done some assembly. We've identified the genes. So now we have the genes that are coming from the um, assembled contigs that we split up into individual genes. And then we have the singletons as well. Uh, which are also coming from their own kind of unique transcripts. How do we annotate all of this? Uh, so our pipeline uses this kind of three-tiered approach. The first uses BWA to try and identify these kind of strict matches, so things that are pretty much identical to something in the reference database very fast. Uh, next one is BLAT. Uh, this is fast, it's less strict than BWA, um, but it is better than BLAST or we actually use diamond. So diamond is slower than BLAT and BWA. Um, it is somewhat, yeah, um, uh, it's it's less strict than BLAT for sure, um, but we use it in place of BLAST just because it is um, so much faster. Um, but by using this, we're kind of hoping to speed up this entire kind of annotation pipeline. Um, so Diamond comes out with the sorts of matches that your teeth would curl at. It's kind of like, well, this is e, this is a score of five. It's not e to the minus five, it's a score of five. So those of you who run blast searches and generally to get a match to something that you deem a homologue, you use a cutoff of something like e to the minus five. Here you get a score of five. It's kind of like, well, that is that really significant? We more rely on the fact that um, we look at percentage identity over the actual sequence. So these are relatively short sequences. That's why our, um, our p-values uh, are not super great. Uh, but in a way, um, we would argue that it doesn't really matter if we're not getting to the exact um, gene that uh, from the taxon that we might associate it with. Instead, we're more reliant because we're using this more from a functional perspective, then if we can get a match to a gene and that gene is associated with some kind of enzymatic function, it doesn't matter which, which taxon it's coming from, we care more about maybe what that function actually is. And so doing these kind of matches on this kind of peptide, um, so translating the, the DNA sequence into peptide space gives us um, with the kind of percentage identity cutoffs and so on and so forth, uh, gives us more confidence that we're mapping to something that is functionally um, that is functionally related. And so we're really, I guess, at this step, really, really focusing more on the function rather than um, rather than the actual taxa. The taxonomic annotation, we have a completely different approach. So this is purely in terms of functional annotation, trying to identify genes and and what their functions might be. Now, one of the problems that we're facing, and this is this is why these pipelines are getting so bloated and slowed down and taking months to run, are the size of these databases. So the reference genomes are always increasing. And so the amount of memory to perform these searches is really increasing as well, which is requiring these large memory compute clusters where each node has access to hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Uh, now, there are software solutions where we can split databases. One thing that we are now starting to experiment more with are these custom databases. And so uh, what we're showing here are results from 100,000 reads from a, a SQL metatranscript home. And what happens when we're comparing against the Trocoflan 2 database or the Trocoflan 3 database from, um, from the human um, um, software pipeline? We find that our custom database of 500 genomes, so these are genomes, these are mags and genomes that have been assembled from um, um, previously generated SQL microbiomes from chickens. Um, this is a relatively small database, just 1.1 um, gigabases in size. Compare that to 66 gigabases for the human three uh, database. And then when we look at the quality of the alignments, we get much higher quality than we do with these Trocoflan databases as well. 
So I think there's gathering appreciation that these custom databases are really important, really driving, I think, our ability to analyze these data sets. Otherwise, we just get lost within just the ever increasing number of genomes um, that have been generated. So how do we go about assembling these custom databases? So I was at the Sanger Center um, at the beginning of uh, May and um, met with some of the Magnify team. So uh, I, Morgan, I think, mentioned Magnify uh, yesterday. So this is this seems to be a great resource. What they're doing is they're compiling and they're generating mags for all the different metagenomes that have been published. And they're starting to collate them into niche specific collections. So if you're interested, for example, in a acid mine drainage uh, metatranscriptome, you could go to the Magnify database, identify all the mags, and pull out a collection of mags associated with metagenome projects associated with acid mine drainage. The same, for example, for chicken gut, for the pig guts, for deep sea. And so this seems to be a really useful approach for actually limiting the size of the databases that we need to be searching against and to speed up our actual annotation and make sure that we're not spending months uh, processing these data sets, but we can try and get this down to weeks or even days. So I think that's a really useful approach, and I think that's a really good kind of um, really good innovation. I think that that they that someone is actually doing that and putting those collections together. Um, and then finally, just to mention in terms of the actual processing of the reads, um, these are RNA seq reads. If we are thinking of a typical RNA-seq experiment, we're converting um, our reads into expression values. So whereas in the old days, you'd run a microarray experiment and you'd look at the brightness of the spot to quantify whether the gene was up or down regulated, here we're looking at the counts of reads that are associated with each of these transcripts. But we have to account for the fact that these transcripts are different sizes. And so there's this concept of this RPKM, reads per kilobase of transcript mapped. So here you're normalizing for the length of each of the transcripts. And so again, as part of our pipeline, we can incorporate tools such as bow tie and cufflinks to actually normalize for the lengths of the transcripts and come up with a more accurate um, kind of accounting of uh, gene expression. Okay. Um, so that's kind of functional annotation, that's kind of normalization of the reads. Uh, just spend a few minutes on taxonomic annotation. So, um, so taxonomic annotation, we have alignment tools such as BWA and diamonds. Um, and I mentioned that because these are relatively short reads, uh, it can be quite challenging just to use those kind of tools to identify taxa. And so there's a number of compositional methods that are available. And again, Morgan uh, referred to some of these yesterday morning. Uh, so Kraken2, for example, is probably a good approach. We don't actually use Kraken2 at the moment. We will be putting that into our pipeline shortly. Um, but at the moment, we're combining results of, I think, Kaiju centrifuge and actual diamond searches as well to give us a breakdown of which taxa are within our sample. Just give you an idea of the performance in terms of taxonomic classification. So we have this majority voting rule, as I mentioned, with diamonds. Oh, diamond, kaiju, and centrifuge. Um, so this is from a data set of mice. So these are mouse gut taxa. And um, on the left-hand side is the gold standard. This is where we know within these mice, these were infected with these ultra Schedler flora. Uh, under germ-free conditions. And we know that there's, I think it's uh, nine different taxa associated with this altered Schedler flora. So that's all we should find in this mice. And so we can use BWA to specifically come up with a gold standard to identify, yes, we've got five minutes left. Perfect. I've only got half an hour left in this talk. So that's great. Um, so we can see none of the pipelines really perform as well as the gold standard. But, um, and again, I think this is something we need to be a little bit aware of when we're running these pipelines is they're not giving us necessarily the truth. And we do have to be a little bit careful about some of these um, errors that can 
that can creep in and miss annotations and particularly in terms of tax on that we shouldn't take for granted that what the tax on the program says we have may not actually be the tax on that's actually present. Um, this is just to show the difference between 16S data and metatranscript tome data. So the top is 16S data, the bottom is metatranscript tome data. And so we can identify uh, groups of bacteria that are present, uh, but apparently not active. And we can also identify other taxa that may not be very abundant that can be very active. So again, just emphasizing that metatranscriptomics can give us information that metagenomic 16S sequencing can't. They get roughly the same taxa, but this really tells you what's important within your data set. Uh, this was an interesting study that was uh, published. Uh, when was this? This was 20, yeah, just last year. Uh, so this was looking at using meta, meta genomics, meta transcriptomics, look at the ecology of uh, the vaginal microbiome and looking at the evolution of uh, the vaginal microbiome over time. And what they found was that the expression from the meta transcriptomics was actually the better predictor of what the colony dynamics in terms of the abundance at the next time step was going to be than the metagenomics. So again, this just emphasizes that it's the activity, it's the actual expression of the genes and pathways, which is important for helping us understand how these kind of niches, how these microbiomes are actually evolving. And part of the reason that they gave is that DNA can be slow to degrade, and so it's hanging around and it's not really giving you an accurate reflection of what is happening at that point in time. Um, so the last few slides I just want to mention, I am going to go oh, five to 10 minutes over, sorry, Sydney. Um, just in terms of functional annotation, once reads have been assigned to transcripts, these transcripts have hopefully been annotated with functions. Again, Morgan went through some of this uh, yesterday, but I think it's worth just going over again uh, this concept of functional annotation and what we do with this function annotation where we get that data. So in addition to the Uniprop database, there's the Eggnog database, and this again gives you mappings to things like gene ontology terms, keg enzymes, keg modules, uh, kzymes as well. Um, we find that gene ontology terms can be challenging to summarize. So there is a side escape uh, tool and a plugin called Bingo, which enables you to identify over enriched gene ontology terms. Otherwise, you see these papers and they just give these bar charts of these gene ontology terms. Kind of, well, I have no idea really what that means. And so I think this gets at the crux of how do we interpret these really complex data sets in some intuitive fashion that is not just staring at a list of bar graphs showing us that one function is at some level or some other function is at another level. And this is where I think uh, we're now starting to mature more and more as a field in terms of metagenomics, metatranscriptomics. So every time we do a new metatranscriptomics run in our lab, we try and identify a new functional category that we can add into our pipeline. So things that we've done recently are looking at things like iron capture, so siderophores, iron storage kind of pathways. And there's a nice tool called FEGenie. So there's this concept of these other databases out there, which are really good at focusing on subsystems that are associated with different functions of bacteria. And so can we start taking these kind of more specialized databases, putting them into our, uh, into our pipeline so that we can get a readout of, for example, not just metabolism, but also iron capture, iron transport, AMR genes. Again, Morgan mentioned the CARD database. Um, cell wall biogenesis genes that I showed right at the beginning. This is from protein-protein interaction data sets that have been generated for bacteria. So again, there's a number of these kinds of databases and data sets out there that we can start placing these uh, sets into kind of these broader functional categories to get more of an intuitive understanding of what are the functions that are up down regulated and what are the actual genes involved in these that isn't just reliant on these very broad gene ontology terms um, we've done a lot of metabolic reconstructions in our lab it's one of the things we've been really doing for i think the past 15 years or so coming up with different tools one of our in-house tools is detect this is part of our pipeline we think in metapro we do a really good job of annotating enzymes detecting enzymes with high confidence high quality um, and this enables us to come up with, uh, for example, sets of enzymes for each taxon. And I'm not going to mention too much of this today, but again, just thinking about future, where are we going with these kind of ideas? 
is we can start thinking from these data sets. And again, you could be applying this to metagenomic data sets and these mags is coming up with these metabolic reconstructions. So for each taxon within your data set, you can generate a metabolic reconstruction. That metabolic reconstruction tells you what metabolic capabilities each of those taxa actually has. And this tool GAPSEEK came out last year. It's, it's, it does a really good job of saying, these are the enzymes that have been annotated. I'm going to fill in the gaps in these pathways because these pathways would not be functional without these enzymes there. And so it uses your initial set of gene predictions to fill in those gaps and come up with a model, a metabolic model of your, um, of your particular taxon. And this is where we think the next generation is coming from for starting to interrogate these data sets is metabolic modeling. So for example, from a chicken data set, we can identify the taxa, we can build metabolic models for these individual taxa. And then there are these metabolic modeling tools. Here, this is one called Baccarina. Each of these dots represents an individual bacteria. And you use these models to predict the evolution of growth, the evolution of the structure of this community. And these models enable you to do things like, uh, what happens if I change the feed? Once if I add in this organism, this probiotic, how's that gonna change the community? You can make predictions as to what kind of metabolites are going to be produced and so forth. So we think that um, tying up these kind of metabolic predictions from your metatranscriptome, from your mags, enables you to start moving into these more sophisticated analyses where you can actually model what your data is actually telling you. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention a couple of slides on visualization of results. Um, so here we use uh, Cytoscape. Again, we find this a generally useful network visualization tool. We can be using it for all sorts of our analyses. It creates nice figures for papers and so forth. And we think it's quite intuitive. So here, for example, this is from a mouse metatranscriptome. And here we've just mapped on the gene expression data from different taxa on each of these enzymes. And I'm just highlighting at the bottom there, the conversion, this enzyme here, which is involved in the interconversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, seems to be largely mediated by bacteroides. So that seems to be contributing an important function. And using these kind of visualizations, you can see which tax are really doing which parts of um, the main function of the pathway. One thing we, uh, again, with RNA-seq is we're interested in differentially expressed genes. Um, this is challenging for these metatranscriptome data sets. These very complex data sets. The statistics don't quite, aren't quite appropriate uh, for applying tools like DEC2, Edge R. And so we're really reliant on new methods being developed for doing differential expression. At the moment, we're, we kind of rely on DEC2. We know that it's, that it's prone to false positives. Um, but when we've uh, tried alternative methods like ALDAX2 or ANCOM, we find that effectively you don't get anything out. And so it's kind of like, well, that was a whole waste of time if we're just going to apply ALDEX2 or, or ANCOM. It's telling us that nothing is significant. So we go back to DEC2, and that's where these gene set enrichment analyses then gives us more confidence. Um, so one thing that uh, these methods need to start taking into account is the need to normalize for uh, taxon or gene abundance. So for example, within your data set, if one of your data set doubles a taxon, you might expect that the number of transcripts are also gonna double, but that's purely related to the fact, not because that taxon's increasing its gene expression, it's just that that taxon is increasing its abundance. So there's this need to kind of normalize uh, for, for this taxon. And so there's this concept of taxon specific scaling. Um, and uh, this is very much a work in progress. Um, I think people are starting to work on what are the best approaches to making sure that we can detect really significant statistically supported um, genes that are differentially expressed. So finally, as I mentioned, it's a little bit depressing in terms of the statistical measures out there. What can we do about that? So I think gene set enrichment analysis is really the way forward. So this gives you an additional layer of statistical support in terms of which functions are being up or down regulated. So the idea is you're collapsing, rather than relying on an individual gene being up or down regulated, you're collapsing genes that are associated with one specific function into a group. And you're seeing if that group is enriched in that type of genes. And there you've got a lot more confidence that a particular function being up or down regulated. <laughs>